Um, thanks everyone for being able to join. Um, today's meeting is going to actually be twofold. It's not only going to be the panel discussion, but we're going to have a quick uh, general body meeting and some officer elections or board elections. Sorry. So let's go ahead and get started. So we currently have, you know, our officers and then we have our alumni board. The asterisk at the top denotes a re-election or a seat opening. We're just going to go ahead and do a quick poll. Um, David will be able to come on and guide us through that. But before we go ahead, we also want to just introduce some of our new candidates um, and have them give like a quick introduction. We have some stuff written about them, but just for succinct purposes so we can actually get to the panel, we'll go ahead and hear from them. I don't know if Kim was able to make it, so I'll go ahead and give a quick overview of Kim. So Kim is currently a controls engineer based out of Dallas. She graduated from Ohio State, and she looks to join the Alumni Society for, you know, being able to, she hopes to join the Alumni Society to really focus on, on communication and bringing Buckeye engineers together and fusing Ohio State STEM with effective altruism. The next candidate who we have with us today is Grace. Grace, did you just want to give a quick overview of, you know, what you're interested in and who you are? Sure. Hi, I am Grace Permarin. I graduated from Ohio State in 2016 with my bachelor's in double E. And uh, I focused on controls, but I also, I really like robotics, um, embedded systems, kind of anything where you just, I just want to get paid to tinker with stuff basically. Um, and I, I hope to be on the, the board and help out with being able to do cool things that we wouldn't be able to do by ourselves. So maybe like a make a thon or hack a thon or um, just, you know, doing the fun parts of engineering that sometimes we can forget about. Sweet. Thank you, Grace. And then we also have Mary. Mary, did you want to just give a quick overview about yourself? Hi, I'm Mary Berkeley. Uh, I am a competitive economic transmission planner at AEP um, out in the New Albany transmission office. Uh, so I work a lot on interconnecting renewable electricity, uh, changing generation resources and off footprint competitive planning. Um, I graduated from undergrad in ECE at Ohio State in 2017 and um, with my master's under Professor Conejo in 2018. And I also was really lucky to come back and lecture at Ohio State for uh, power systems, ECE 3040 in 2019. So um, really this just is one more way to be involved and stay connected to the ECE department, to OSU, um, who I love and I, I really think now is a, a really important time to stay connected to each other. So that's something I'm passionate about, connecting electrical engineers and, and creating opportunities for that. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it off to David. If David, you want to come off mute and just help facilitate the quick election, you'll all see a poll. Sure. Hi, I'm David Bradway. I am uh, just finishing my second three year term on the board. And uh, I'd like to thank all the board members that have served throughout the years, including um, people for whom we're um, going to elect new um, uh, candidates and um, thank them for their service. So uh, Gersharon Rehal, Jackie Yao, and Aaron Joseph are um, finishing their, um, their slots on the board. And so we currently have uh, four uh, three-year terms, two two-year terms, and one one year term that we're going to fill tonight. And so conveniently we have uh, seven candidates. Uh, the four that are running for re-election are myself, David Bradway, uh, Vimo Buck, uh, who's the treasurer, Zia Muhammad, who you've heard from is the president, and Bradley Clymer, who is the founder, member, and longtime secretary of uh, the society. So I think we can have the, the uh, poll come up now. And there's just a question, do you approve of these candidates? And uh, I think it's just a simple yes or no. Sweet, thanks for that, David. Just take a second to quickly enter your votes and then 
we'll be able to find out from Melinda if the was passed. Okay, I think we can end the polling. Sweet. Seems All right, it was congratulations. A Unanimous vote. Excellent. Thank you for everyone who uh, reached out. It's part of my job as the uh, the chair of the membership committee to uh, engage with um, new folks who want to get involved and to reach out and uh, and see how we can fit them into our operations. So thank you for all those who uh, who came forward to uh, serve your ECE community. And uh, I'm looking forward to some fresh faces that I think we've done well in this uh, um, pandemic Zoom environment because we've we've been working uh, as a board partially remotely for a long time. So everyone has uh, been really good about adapting. And we'll hear more about adapting in, in the next segment here. So um, Zia, if you'd like to take it from here, thank you. Yeah, thanks again, David, and thanks everyone for voting. Um, so let's actually get into the panel discussion. Uh, as we all know, um, much of the world has been dealing with uh, COVID-19, and we wanted to gather a selection of speakers today to really talk about what does that look like for universities? And how does university learning in the COVID era really relate to students, professors, as well as researchers? So on our researchers, or sorry, our discussion themes that we have um, that we're going to be focusing in on are around the classroom and lab experiences, student life, extracurriculars, and research activities. And so we're going to be asking each one of our panelists to quick, give a quick overview of who they are and then I'll be moderating the panel and asking questions on you know, one of these four themes. So with that, let me go ahead and start introducing some of the panelists. Um, when you see your face, maybe in the order that it shows up, you can just give a quick overview of you know, who you are. So let's start with two of our professors at Ohio State, uh, Dr. Clymer and Dr. Bivik, who will be able to speak to you know, what it's like as from a professor's experience. Steve, do you want to go first? Okay, I mean, I'm fine. Um, so I'm, I'm Steve Bivick. I've been at Ohio State uh, going on, on 35 years. Uh, so COVID makes you think about retirement, but uh, fortunately uh, you all uh, make me think about not retiring. So thank you for inviting me to be here. I admire Brad's leadership in this and he and our offices used to be right next to each other. We haven't been there in a while. Um, so I'm glad to see all the alums, uh, and uh, thanks for Grace for shouting out for the Makeathon and the Hackathon. So the uh, I, I'll uh, just say that I'm heavily involved with uh, those kinds of activities. We like to have alumni involved. Uh, Julie Armstrong's here; she's the director of that program. I actually work for her under those activities. So happy to to talk, and uh, thanks for having me. Sweet, thank you, uh, Dr. Clemmer. A quick overview. Uh, or introduction. Yeah, so uh, I'm Bradley Clymer. Uh, I'm starting my 34th year teaching at Ohio State, I think. <clears throat> so I've been here a while too. Uh, and even though Stevenson in the office next to mine, I'm in my office almost every day. Wow. Uh, because I have been teaching a hybrid style class. I'm teaching one of the sophomore classes, uh, 2050, the sophomore DSP class. And we've set that up so that we can uh, have about um, a third of the class come on Monday, a third of the class come on Wednesday, a third of the class come on Friday. We can talk more about that later, uh, about how many people actually come in. But uh, uh, I think especially for the younger students, the earlier classes, it's helpful for them to try to get face-to-face, pers -face, personal, in-person contact as much as they can. So I tried to set that up for that uh, so it happens. So. Uh, that's kind of where I'm sitting. Thank you. Uh, the other panelist we have is Dr. Rajan, who will be able to speak more about what it's like doing research during COVID. Uh, Dr. Rajan, did you just want to give a quick introduction? Hi, everyone. I'm Siddharth Rajan. I'm professor uh, in the solid state electronics and photonics area. And since we do a lot of experimental work, uh, I guess it was pe maybe people thought it would be a good idea uh, to see how labs were impacted. So I'll try to give you a feel of how things happened as the COVID started and when labs shut down. Uh, and I'll try to give you a 
uh, sort of an overview of everything that happened. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Day, who is uh, part of our clinical counseling department at Ohio State, do you just want to give a quick introduction of yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Stephanie Day. I've been with OSU since um, last year around Thanksgiving, so not quite one year yet. Um, but I've been doing counseling with folks across Ohio um, and in some other states since 1997. And I'm happy to be with you here tonight. I'm actually the clinical counselor who is specifically assigned to serve College of Engineering students who need mental health counseling support from our counseling consultation service. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining. And then our students. We have two student representatives, Shivam and Abby. If you guys just want to give a quick introduction. Abby, if you'd like to go first. I think unmute. you might be on mute. Yeah, um, I'm Abby. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm Abby. I'm a second, okay, perfect. Um, I'm a second year in electrical engineering with a minor in computer science. Awesome. And then Shivam, did you want to go? Yes, so I am Shivam Patel. Uh, thank you all for having us. <clears throat> I am a uh, fourth year ECE student. I'm actually graduating this December, so uh, it's very unprecedented times, but I'm excited to hopefully uh, transition back to a period of recovery. And during these times, so I do want to thank you just having that opportunity to speak, uh, to let us share our experiences. It's not very often that if students can actually speak to faculty, um, to previous alumni. So thank you for that. Awesome. So uh, and, you and just a minute, Siobhan, maybe you should uh, explain your role in the IEEE chapter. Yeah, so uh, I am currently the uh, e-council representative and the alumni representative uh, with IEEE. Uh, since I'm graduating this de December, actually Abby is going to be my uh, predecessor, so she will be following up with that. So thank you, Abby. <laughs> awesome. So we have these six panelists here. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be asking them questions in popcorn style. So we had those four themes, the classroom and lab experiences, student life, extracurriculars, and research. And so to make sure each panelist is engaged and we are rotating throughout the themes, I'm going to be moderating and asking specific questions. And so let's get started. I think the biggest impact that you know, COVID-19 has had is directly upon students. And so maybe we can get started with asking a question towards the students. Um, let's start with you, Abby. What would you say are some of the biggest impacts on your experience, both from a learning point of view and when it comes to college life? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is um, not being able to have in-person classes. Um, most of my classes, since I'm only a sophomore, are like bigger. So um, a lot of them are able to be asynchronous, which gives me a lot more flexibility with being involved with like IEEE and SWE and some other student orgs, which is really nice. But it also gives me a lot of opportunity to get behind, which <laughs> can be a little bit problematic. And then um, some of my smaller classes are, um, they are like hybrid style, like I think Dr. Clymer was talking about. And that is nice to be able to go in person a couple days a week. But at the same time, I feel like it just gives some kind of in inconsistency. And then um, I know a lot of my peers have either been in quarantine or have gone home for other reasons. And it just kind of messes up the schedule almost because um, not all the professors are recording the in-person lectures and then it just kind of throws everyone off. Awesome. Thanks for being able to share some of that. Siobhan, did you have anything to add? And again, you know, if anyone else has anything to chime in, you know, it's a discussion. So feel free to you know, interject if you have some thoughts. Yeah, so similar to Abby, uh, most of my classes are, are online. I do have one in-person lab. Uh, I do enjoy the flexibility of just being able to watch those uh, lectures that are already pre-recorded. Uh, do that on my own time, which is very nice, uh, knowing that I work uh, at a very unpredictable schedule. 
but it also gives way for that opportunity to slack off a little bit. What I really like about having those in-person classes is that when you're there, you're very engaged. You don't want to fall behind. You want to understand exactly what the professor is saying. So being there in person, uh, you're essentially, you're devoting that amount of time to it, which is a lot easier to do in person rather at home, surrounded by computer screens. It's easy to get distracted. Um, but what also has been nice is that it was being able to reach out to professors has been very easy. Uh, they're always constantly looking at their emails. So it's been nice knowing that if I do have questions, uh, I will, I, I know that I'll get an answer within a very short amount of time. Awesome. It's good to hear that, you know, also professors are adapting. On the subject of professors, hey, I know, don't, yep. Yeah, is it all right if we interject and ask questions related to? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask Shivan and, and Abby. I mean, what I'm hearing is that you're you're experiencing a new level of time management responsibility, and I'm just wondering if if you got any help or guidance as to how you might be able to do that better from either the department or the college or or anything. As far as um, from the college, not really. At least I haven't like seen anything in an email or anything like that. Um, a lot of professors have just been emphasizing, you can do it whenever you want, but like get it done by the end of the week. And then <laughs> things just kind of end up piling up. Um, I know a lot of student orgs, I think SWE, um, they were doing a segment on um, time blocking, which has been really helpful. But I, yeah, I think it definitely would be really helpful if the college like put out something about how to manage your time, because I know a lot of the classes are synchronous, but those asynchronous ones are really hard to Uh, yeah, it, just as she said, I haven't really heard much from the college about um, better time management skills. Um, I have not looked into any other resources that other student orgs are providing. So I'm assuming that there might be some out there. We just actually have to go look for it. But for the most part, I've been just trying to adapt on my own for that. A question for uh, Dr. Clymer and Dr. Bivik. Um, either one of you, you know, the students kind of mentioned and one of you alluded to having these hybrid classes earlier. Can you kind of comment on how, you know, from the professor point of view, the department has modified in classroom learning and how, you know, students have the option for both remote or in-person classes? Um, Brad, you have the hybrid, so you go ahead. Yeah, so it's, it's a little unusual in that the class I'm teaching has 89 students registered for it. So it's, it's a really big class. It's 2050, it's one of our sophomore classes. Uh, and, but, and, and as a result from that, uh, we had to split it into thirds so we could have cohort groups be under the 50, uh, with the 50 student maximum for in-class meeting times uh, for, for us. Um, Interestingly, I found that only about 15 students out of the 89 students have been regularly coming to in-person live lectures. And I think there, that's, there's multiple reasons for that. One of them is, if they're not coming into campus anyhow, why come into campus just for one class? Uh, however, I think it's also kind of important that um, the students who are coming in are the same students who are coming in regularly. And it's because they kind of uh, feel it's important to have that live in-person uh, um, experience for part of the labs or for, 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 the, for the lectures, uh, for the classes. Um, I'm recording everything. I've recorded everything I've taught since 2006. And so, so in that sense, from my teaching point of view, it hasn't changed that much, except for the population in the classroom that I'm teaching is much smaller now than it used to be. Uh, so uh, I've, been, I've been doing the recording lectures and posting them through Mediasite and Carmen every class I've taught since 2006. So, so that aspect of teaching for me hasn't really changed that much. Uh, and for me as a professor, I really need to have the students in 
the lecture hall so I can look at them and see if they're getting what I'm saying or not. And I can force them to ask questions when it seems like they're not getting it. Uh, and Or when I've talked about something that I know is going to be hard for them, I stop and force them to ask questions. There have been three lectures so far this, this, uh, this um, semester where nobody has shown up. And I'll tell you, I cover a lot of material in those, those lectures because nobody is around to ask questions. However, I really miss the, the opportunity to, to sort of say, no, I know we just talked about something that's really complicated and you probably have questions, so stop and ask questions for me and before we go on. And we're missing some of those opportunities. Uh, I also feel, uh, because it's a sophomore level class, I think the online teaching is especially hard for the earlier classes and the students who are earlier on in their education stuff. I think by the time students get to be seniors or graduate students, they've built a certain amount of discipline that makes it easier for them to do self-learning or online learning at their own pace and keep be able to keep and maintain deadlines and things like that for their classes. I think it's much harder for much younger students to be able to do that. So that's one of the reasons I really pushed hard to be able to do the uh, hybrid mode for these sophomore classes. And I'm happy that even if even if 15% of the class is the only people taking care, taking advantage of the in-person learning, that's fine for me. It's, hel it's helping me teach a better class. Bradley, uh, there's a question in our chat from Will Jacobs. He's asking okay. if, if the other students can um, Zoom and chat. You don't, you're not live streaming anything. You're recording it. So uh, I, the, I have different types of cameras. <laughs> That, that are available to me. And unfortunately, the best quality camera for capturing what I'm doing for the lecture is not webcam available. Uh, and so I early on, it took a while for the uh, classroom IT people to get the classroom set. I'm teaching in the one of the ballrooms in the Blackwell Inn, by the way. Uh, so it took a while for them to get the, the uh, projection system, everything like that, to be able to, to handle just a regular HDMI output from my camera and being able to project it and, and not have sound problems and everything like that. So the first week of class, I was using really my webcam and my, uh, that I can do live zooming, but the quality of that camera for being able to do lectures is not nearly as good. And so when they got the console changed over so I could do my better camera, I've been doing it. So I record it, it's asynchronous, and uh, the lectures are available within 20 minutes after the end of my, my live lecture. So there isn't a huge delay, but the people who are not in the room cannot, cannot ask live questions. So I, I can jump in as a contrary there a little bit. Um, so I do a completely online course. It's a after Brad's. It's it's thirty twenty. It's the junior level electronics, and uh, I've had to purposely uh, help students uh, manage their time in that course. So I, I think it's not done at the college level, um, but it is done at the university level. And so, uh, and and I'm curious, you know, maybe Stephanie Day can follow me a little bit about. Uh, so the university has a Keep Learning uh, website, and the university itself has put in a lot of resources to uh, help students do time management across the university. The struggle we have in the College of Engineering is our, our students are so overwhelmed with courses that they tend not to be able to tap into the university as well. Um, I saw Don Stenta was here. I was sorry I didn't do a shout out to him. He's he's head of the alumni organization, I think, at OSU, and he's very savvy about student life. Um, and so uh, we both know each other from the, the STEP program, uh, which has a lot of uh, activities for students to help uh, manage their time and do things. So I think um, the problem with the college is, is it's sort of too focused sometimes and, and we don't pay attention to the university itself. Um, I'll say that one thing the university did, which was remarkable, this was an initiative by President Drake, was he uh, gave everyone a raise who wanted to go through teacher training. So I went through that. Uh, it's very, very helpful, it turned out, uh, because at the time I went through it, I procrastinated a little bit. 
Uh, so COVID was hitting. And so I did all my training for online courses. I, I did all my training based on COVID. And that turned out to be a big help. Um, I'll tell you, um, my discussions in my online course are far better than anything I've ever had in class. Uh, so we were trained to uh, do open-ended discussions to get people to reply to each other, to form groups. Um, and I find that you know, to get into Ohio State these days, you have to be in the top of your class. I mean, every year Ohio State boasts that you know, it's harder to get in this year than it was the year before. And they've been doing that for 15 years. So the level of students coming in now are as best as I've ever seen. And if you give them a chance to speak like we've done here, you learn tremendous things. And so Shivam and Abby, thank you for bringing forward that uh, response to Mark's question. Uh, that was noted and I would be taken back to our leadership uh, and say, hey, you know, we've got students that are, we haven't really done well enough by them. We need to plug them into the university a little bit better. So I also reached out to people who had done online for a long time. Nursing has a maker space. And so I work with nursing. Uh, they do all their online course. Nursing's rated in OSU top two nursing program in the country for being online. So really strong techniques there. Um, so I, I think it's going to be interesting how it all plays out. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Professor Clymer and Professor Bibic for being able to share that. As Dr. Bibic mentioned, um, wanted to call on uh, Dr. Day to kind of ask, there's so many support systems that are available at Ohio State. Are you able to comment on you know, what some of these are and how students are taking advantage of them or what students are doing when provided these options? Yes, thank you for that question. And I appreciate the professors and students' comments. Uh, one thing to keep in mind that when I'm talking to students, I'm talking to students who have self-identified a a level of stress that is over and above what maybe a typical student is experiencing. So they're coming forward asking for help. So I have somewhat of a skewed population and I will always share that caveat. But um, in that any of us can experience the benefit of counseling, we're normal in that way too. Does that make sense? That yes. we both have a population, I have a population of people who are asking for help, who are having symptoms that are concerning to them, but simultaneously, we're all living in a pandemic. We're all having a difficult time right now. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I only started working for OSU last Thanksgiving. And so for the first, the very tail end of that semester and then the beginning of this um, spring semester, I was getting to know all the College of Engineering students, the departments, meeting professors, understanding the, all the majors that are involved, just getting oriented really. And then COVID hit in mid-March. Actually, I ended up being one of the first employees, get an award, um, for testing positive. I had COVID in um, early March during spring break, in fact, and I would have contracted it very early at OSU, uh, late February, because um, that's all I was doing was going to work. And um, very luckily, I, I healed from it after a six-week bout of symptoms and did not require hospitalization. But I've been working from home since. Um, and so even before the pandemic and since March, I've been hearing students from the engineering schools just commenting on the intense workload, right? Already was working with students around time management pre-COVID. Already was working with students about prioritizing work-life balance, um, already having fantasize, fantasies about how I might talk to these professors <laughs> about the demands they're putting on my clients. So um, feel, feeling the burn, as you will, if you would, um, about the, the intense pressure that students are facing. I found a lot of students actually, when they went, got to go home around uh, spring break, and then if, if you will, our second sing, spring break, um, began to express, the clients I had been seeing, began to express a sense of relief to be at home because the demands to be um, almost over-involved were less. So we have students who, like the students in this organization, and I'm sure the alumni who are continuing to participate in this organization, who are trying to get good grades in all their classes, trying to do every ounce of every reading, every assignment, every lecture, every note, Every, every math problem, 
also trying to participate in, in clubs, look for internships, volunteer opportunities. They were just over-programmed and, and strapped for time to begin with. Um, and so there was almost a relief to be at home only doing one thing, just school. Um, and then over the summer, that was kind of, that kind of continued. And now we're into this new semester where everyone is now trying to figure out how to bring back that intensity. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of students struggling with time management, struggling with the juggle, struggling with the isolation. I created an eight minute uh, video about how to have a better work-life balance in the time of COVID, including some time management techniques, some mental health techniques, um, and that's on our website under, under my, I've a, the in, embedded clinicians have our own page. Um, so under the College of Engineering Embedded Clinicians page on CCS's website. So I'm seeing a lot of struggles in the students and I've been um, interviewing other, other colleagues about what they're seeing and the students who aren't reaching out, what are they seeing? And time management was a major issue. I have been trying to convince our students to try, at CCS we have workshops that we run, we have a, a drop-in service that we call Let's Talk, we have um, counseling groups, individual counseling, couples counseling. And then we also have on campus the Dennis Learning Center, we have the Wellness Center. We have a lot of resources, but my experience is that students are overwhelmed by the sheer number of options that are available. And so a student says to me, I have this specific need. And I'm like, oh, well, that place over there does that. Hang out with them. And they're like, lady, can I just hang out with you for that? Does that make sense? They're just, they're just it's so expansive. Um, we'll, we might send an email to a student that has 20 resources tagged with the websites in there. And to me, I'm like, look how thorough we're being. But from the student's perspective, whoa, there's too many things to click on. I just need someone to walk me through it. And so we've kind, I've had to kind of reel that back in and, and tone it down a bit and stop being the super helper and just be the helper. Just do that one or two things that's gonna make a difference right now for that student and then introduce the next resource when they have brain space, when they can, where it's digestible because it's just too overwhelming all at once. And, and I, don't, I don't know if that resonates with folks, but that's my instinct right now. That was really insightful, especially the part where you were talking about being able to like empathize with some of your students and, you know, when they get this list of resources, they don't necessarily view it as that, but it's, oh my God, she's gave me some more stuff. What are we able to do with this? Abby, I think you wanted to comment as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to just agree and say like, I think um, at the end of every email from every student org, it's like, um, oh, you can go to Dennis Learning Center for this. You can go to consultation services for this. And I feel like I need a spreadsheet to keep it all together. But then at the same time, if you go and look at the resources from Dennis Learning Center, it's like, oh, you can do everything as long as you budget your time right. And then counseling and consultation, I feel like part of it's like, it's okay if you don't do everything and the wellness center gives you the same message. So then it's just like when you can't accomplish everything by simply planning out your time the right way, then it sort of feels like a failure. seems like one of the, the themes that we've been hearing across all of the disciplines is really around time management. Um, question for you, Dr. Rajan. Um, you had mentioned that you were in, you know, the research space and you were actually going in and having to, you know, work with, you know, solid state labs. How has COVID kind of changed your approach to research and do you feel like you're still able to make as much progress or can you comment on that? Sure. Um... You know, uh, I think uh, I, te I, you know, I was teaching last semester. I'm teaching this semester too. And um, I think last semester was in a way probably easier because I think like someone mentioned last semester since COVID had just struck, everyone was sort of treating it like an abnormal situation. Whereas I think this semester, everyone feels like it's back to normal. So the students might actually feel more pressure in classes during this semester. Now in research, um, we have many PhD students in the department who are doing research. I think we may have around 200. And for them, uh, when something like this happens, uh, you know, all they're doing is research. And if they can't do it, 
it's really stressful because they're staying, they're sitting alone and they're not making any progress to something that they've been so passionate about. So it was very stressful. And in fact, you know, I, I put together some slides and one of the things that I noted there was definitely the first thing I noted, all my students I could tell. I, in my research group, I have around 12 to 13 PhD students, but I'm sure in other groups also, uh, I, I, could, I could tell that they were all stressed out because there's this uncertainty about not being able to do anything, right? Um, and, and also about what's gonna happen in the future. Um, and, and I think uh, eventually it worked out, you know, but, uh, but there, there, were, there were some consequences and I'd definitely like to, you know, I think what Dr. Day brought up was very, very good. Um, but I had students who quit grad school, okay, uh, right after COVID and the time after that, because, because they had so much anxiety and stress that they just felt that they couldn't do it. They just, they just left. So, um, I, I, but I don't think it's something that, you know, was because of COVID. I think we always had all this anxiety and stress in our sort of general environment, right? We're just like that. We're kind of all high, high strung people who try to do too much in too little time. Uh, but I think it just all came in. And, you know, when COVID came, it was like, it really created that extra weight that broke a lot of people's resolve in graduate school. And it's quite surprising actually to see that. A follow-up question to that as well. Um, you mentioned, you know, a lot of these graduate students not only having to deal with the stress, but, you know, just the ability that they might not be able to do their research. Um, question for you as well, as some of the other professors on the panel, like, do you foresee any changes coming to graduate programs, at least until this COVID time? Um, whether that's, you know, students having some flexibility in doing research remotely, or, you know, just the general sense of how do they make progress towards their degree when they can't really go into a lab to do research? Uh, Brad, Steve, do you want to say anything? Or? Go ahead, uh, Siddharth, and, and we can follow. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, I think the, the time the labs were shut down, that was the problematic time, which was from March 15th, I believe, to um, sometime middle of May, right? Or uh, end of May. Now labs are open, okay? Uh, so labs are all open now and everyone's able to work. And I can't tell you how thrilled we were, you know, after three months of not doing anything, when, you know, a few of my students, PhD students, we had our Zoom meeting and they showed me pictures of stuff that, they, that they'd built, right? And it was super exciting. It was like doing it for the first time. So. Uh, I, I think that we're over that and hopefully we won't have to shut down labs. I think we now we understand COVID well enough that we know that we don't have to shut down everything, right? We keep things controlled, we keep social distancing. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I feel that it'll be fine uh, going ahead. Uh, I, I don't think it'll be an issue, but we've definitely learned a lot uh, from what happened. Um, and I guess Will has a question is some of that stress funding related. Funding related stress is mine. It's not theirs, at least in my group. So there, no, we, there's, there's been some funding issues. You know, there, there were things that were pulled, you know, people pulled the rug under our feet in some projects, but uh, we were okay, we're gonna be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we have a robust enough portfolio of funding. Most of us, you know, uh, that, that we will manage. Right. Uh, and I don't, I, you know, graduate students, PhD students, master students who are on projects who are funded, they should not, it's very important for faculty that they are sort of buffered from, from that stress. They should never have to worry about funding and money. Uh, that, that's, that's my problem to take care of. And, uh, and hopefully for most groups here at OSU, it should be the same. Yeah, so I, I can jump in. So I'm actually seeing an increase in funding. So. Um, but that's because most of my research is in the cloud. So I, I do uh, design and it turns out that uh, because of COVID, uh, more things have moved in the cloud. So if your research was already in the cloud, you're like, wow, this is neat. And uh, so it depends on the areas. And I wanted Siddharth go first because his labs are, are much more hands-on physics-based uh, type stuff. It depends on the area. Um, 
in terms of uh, student labs, we also uh, opened them up. Uh, so uh, Greg Chapman, who couldn't be here, uh, was you know key for that. Uh, we basically run the labs around the clock now, uh, and students are by themselves in the de in a bench, so they're actually learning differently. Um, so I think uh, you know as long as people can still uh, manage by doing social distancing and by being careful and OSU was very aggressive in trying to tap down the positivity rate. I mean, it was a high priority um, and it seems to be working so far. So, uh, you know, we're all, you know, hoping that uh, we just get through this uh, and uh, we're already planning for spring to be in sort of a hybrid online mode, at least to start with and the labs still plan to be open. Um, but definitely, um, everybody feels uh, like they're working harder. Um, and I'll just end with uh, the, the stress factor the, the, that was mentioned. So we have this weird situation where, um, you know, we're almost competing for the students' time. They're so busy. So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, Brad mentioned students won't even come to classes. So sometimes we'll force them to come to class. And it's like a positive feedback. So a, a faculty member will want to get the students time, they'll assign extra homework. And then another faculty will assign extra homework. And we don't communicate with each other and, and tell them, hey, we're all assigning extra homework, we're burying the students, right? And, and so there needs to be a change and it's gonna take some time. I'm hoping that COVID will cause some of those changes and we actually uh, trust the students more to learn on their own, not have to tell them to learn everything. Uh, so that's why we do the hackathon and makeathon kind of things. So um, here's one of the things that that I can see. Um, you know, there's a lot of research, particularly kind of in what I do. I don't really require a lab. I, my, my research is done on computers. People can do it remotely if they need to. But the thing that I see that's different is when I was a graduate student, we had uh, an office that had four or five graduate students sitting in the same office that you could share a little bit about what you're doing, what they're doing. You can learn about, about other things going on. You can also uh, use this to kind of share stress levels too. So, so you can talk about what's going on in your, each of your lives, what's difficult, what's not difficult, and you get a chance to share that. And I think when you, when you remove that interpersonal reaction, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, interpersonal activities that you're getting face to face by sharing offices with people, knowing what other other students are, what's going on for them in their lives. Uh, you don't have that as a mechanism for support anymore. So, you know, you can say my life is difficult, but their life is difficult too. And we can talk about the difficulty and we can get, get through it that way. Uh, and and if everybody is kind of on their own in their own little little holes and 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 working online, they don't have that kind of an interaction to kind of support each other. And I think that that's one of the things that's changing a little bit here. Um, and uh, the other thing that's happening, I I I can't champion Greg Chapman enough because he has done remarkable things about making our labs be able to run under almost impossible circumstances. Uh, but one of the aspects that I'm seeing from my class is my labs were designed to try to be interlocked with lecture timing and to be able to get all the labs in with the facilities that we have, we, we had to start labs in the first week instead of in the sixth week. And so people were doing things in the lab before we talked about it in lecture material and stuff like that. And I've been telling students that, you know, under normal circumstances, we would have talked about this a little bit in lecture before you see these things in the lab uh, or about the same time as you're seeing them in the lab. So the students have been very supportive, kind of knowing that these are unusual situations, uh, but uh, it, it is a little bit difficult, difficult when you've designed a lab, uh, the lab to kind of fit with lectures in a certain way and suddenly they're not synchronized anymore, so. And if I could Some jump in on that. On something Dr. Clymer said, um, sorry to cut you off. No, no, um, fine. Uh, just specifically about social connections and, and the, the, the normalizing presence of colleagues and, and, and fellow students. 
um, is a very important part uh, that that Dr. Clymer just shared on. And I'll just I'll just let you know um, for all of us, our brains are not designed to get our loneliness, um, social interaction quotient through two dimensional video, text, uh, phones, gadgets, and gizmos. Our brain, in in many ways, um, despite our our amazing intelligence, is still living way back when in an evolutionary space where we're, we live in, in tribes and clans. Um, and so our sense of community is three-dimensional. And so I've been talking with a lot of students about how they are having daily contact via video with lots and lots of people and are still tremendously lonely. And that, they, that, is, that is so disruptive to our psyche and they're not understanding because our brain needs people in 3D. We need to be able to spin a person around and see all sides of them. And so I say that for the benefit of everyone in this, in this workshop this evening, um, that if, if you're feeling incredibly lonely um, or you're finding that your loved ones are feeling incredibly lonely, that it's, it's not an ind indicator of your failure as a human being, it's, it's the limitations of our brain. And just to be very intentional about how we spend time together and how um, obviously we need to be socially distant, but your brain really needs to see people in vivo. Yeah, thank you. That's that was more important than what I had to say, and I completely agree with you. Uh, I've been uh, trying to figure out if you know I should buy some Oculus Rifts or some Hives uh, and and sort of do an alternate reality where I can interact in 3D and not be sitting in a chair. But I just wanted to also shout out to. Uh, uh, Dr. Chapman. So I, I have a required lab with 80 students. Uh, Dr. Chapman oversees 800 students. And uh, they used to be four to a bench. They're now one to a bench. So he saw 800 students move up into one to a bench. And, and uh, we're fortunate that he has a lot of operating room experience. Uh, so he came in uh, with a lot of training for everybody about how to even put gloves on and off uh, the way nurses and doctors do. So um, he's so busy that he couldn't be here, and, and that's why, so. Yeah, we, we had a, a meetup with uh, Dr. Chapman. Uh, I think it was about a year ago or so. I know Will was there and Bradley was there. And just what he was doing with a normal schedule in a normal environment was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to think what, if, uh, what yeah. this and these uh, complexities offer is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would be interested to know from Abby and Shivam's perspective, how are you doing with that interaction, that physical or, or that the need to, to have that empathy and, and hearing from other students like uh, Bradley was talking about? Yeah, um, my roommates, I actually have three roommates that I met through um, humanitarian engineering scholars. So they're basically all in the same situation as me. So like we in our house, our apartment, we just have that um, to like complain and like put stress on each other or not put stress on each other, but like normalize the stress, which is really nice. Um, yeah. So you want anything to add? Yeah. Um, well, I also want to thank um, uh, Professor Chapman uh, with giving us that lab opportunity. I would say out of all of my classes being in person, that has by far been my favorite to be actually in person discussing um, on uh, on topics discussions, or uh, even just about general career advice. It was just nice being able to have that one on one interaction with them, uh, rather than communicating over video call. Um, just because understanding uh, body expressions and facial expressions in person is just much easier to read. So um, at any point in time, uh, when my teaching assistants, whenever they felt like I wasn't understanding the topic, they were able to un realize that pretty quickly and get me up to date and help me understand the lab better compared to what it would be over video. So having that lab experience, it, it's just been incredible, uh, especially in these unprecedented times. Awesome. Thanks for I being I also have a question for the students on that. I know, um, as a student and for students, I've taught uh, study groups or, or working together on assignments for classes is a, a, an effective way to learn. Have you found outside of assigned 
lab groups a way to form study groups or work with your peers on assignments? Um, yeah, so, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Abby. Mom. Oh, yeah. Um, so through like student org SWE and I don't, I don't think IEEE does um, study tables, but SWE does virtual study tables, which I know is not super popular. Um, one thing that they've done is put together um, a spreadsheet of students in like your year and your major. So, um, so I've like, we'll meet up with people. I, um, we go to like the new BME building and just sit there with masks and work on homework, which is honestly so helpful. I like can't imagine how um, it would almost feel like office hours. I think if I was on zoom with someone trying to do homework because you'd have to share your screen to show this and that. And that would just, it, it is really helpful to be in person, even if you have to sit far apart with masks on. So I uh, actually have yet to experience an in-person study group. Um, that is actually one of my most effective ways of learning. So it's been very unfortunate that I haven't had that experience. Over Zoom, I find it very difficult, as Abby was saying. Sharing screens is very tough uh, compared to in-person when you can just write on a chalkboard or a whiteboard. Uh, so it's definitely been a little bit of a hindrance, but it, I wouldn't say it's been the worst thing, not having those study groups, just being able to have all those recorded lectures, um, to be able to repeat those, watch those again. I've been able to kind of make up that way and uh, learn the topics a little bit better just by going back through and, rather than um, depending on others to learn. Yeah. Also, um, a lot, I'm in the sophomore EC classes, like 2020, 2060, and they have office hours with TAs at all hours of the day. I don't know if that is a thing that they've done every single year. That's a new thing. But if I'm doing homework, it's almost just would be pointless to ask um, a peer to help me with my homework if I have a TA available that I actually will 100% know. So um, I think for the sophomore level classes, typically uh, 2020 and 2060, the TAs do have in-person office hours that are probably arranged at different times of the day to kind of cover a lot of things. So, so the Zoom aspect of that is probably a new thing. Uh, I do know that this semester I added more office hours and my office is enormous. Uh, and so I could actually have four people in my office and we could social distance and I could even have one person out in the hall and I would, I told them I would do my office hours zooming. And so if you come to my live office hours, bring your, bring your iPad or, or your laptop or whatever, and I'll write under my camera and you can see what I'm writing and we can all be social distance and we can, the people who are online and, and zooming can, can kind of follow along with the same questions and the same answers all together. So far, I've had two people show up in person all semester for, for office hours. But I think that that's about to change because I think people are feeling a little bit more comfortable with being on campus and coming in and doing that live in person office hour type, type uh, of exchange. The interesting thing that, that I found is um, I haven't had any kind of a, a, a uh, a down downtrend in office hours. Uh, I'm getting about the same amount of office hours. People are zooming in for the office hours instead. Uh, the difficulty is sometimes the bandwidth on the Zoom doesn't work out very well for really being able to answer and ask live questions. So sometimes I, I think on the OSU side, if somebody's on an OSU site, the bandwidth is fine, but if they're working from an apartment and they don't have enough bandwidth, then occasionally sound will cut out, cut out and, and it becomes a little bit tedious. So I've even done things where I have the students asking me questions on chat <laughs> and I'll answer them verbally uh, back to them or write things out using, using my camera system so they can kind of see how I'm working the problems. But the technology sometimes, depending on where, where both ends of the Zoom are working, sometimes makes it a little bit more complicated for doing uh, office hours by Zoom. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, you know, as the semester progresses and 
as summer and you know eventual fall semester come back or spring semester to see how you know people are adapting to this i wanted to give a time check we probably have time for maybe one more question if anyone has one um you can I, unmute yourself i do have or... one more yep go for it julia so hopefully in the next couple semesters we will see a return to some sort of new normalcy um, is there anything that you've learned in this new environment that you would like to continue doing even if things were to return to a normal physical learning environment so uh, if I, i'm sure everyone has so there's one thing i'd like to point out i i realize after i so when we after covid i switched to online teaching i was teaching everything online i would record every lecture on my ipad and i found so i went back and looked at the statistics and almost all the students were watching they all attended the lectures they never missed the lectures but they were all watching the lectures again and so then i realized and this is of course you know uh, professor climber has figured this out 15 years ago but many of us had not but i think now it should be almost compulsory everyone has to record every lecture even if you'd give it in person uh, it's very easy to do it we we figured it out now uh, we just use our ipad and we should record all lectures and our entire you know all our course material all of the stuff can now be preserved forever uh, and and students can watch it during the semester but we can even use it later on so i think that's something we've really learned i think it's completely changed the way we're doing that and i think it's going to be great for us it's going to be great for osu for the students for everybody So the awesome. biggest difficulty with recording all of your lectures is you have to be comfortable with having mistakes recorded <laughs> because there inevitably will be mistakes when you make a lecture, right? So, so you have to be comfortable with saying, uh, I made a mistake in lecture, lecture three. Mm -hmm. Here's, here's the correction for that mistake. Right. Uh, and keep, uh, keep moving on. But, but from a faculty point of view, I think people are reluctant to allow their mistakes to be recorded for posterity. But I've been doing it for so long, it doesn't bother me anymore. So I'll, I'll add to that. Um, so um, there are definitely things that are gonna be done. Uh, you look at other universities, I, I talked to one university, they put their whole department on Discord and had all the students do projects on Discord. And uh, I learned that this, uh, weekend at the uh, high school hackathon and uh, I'm a believer in that I can see how that can happen I have already been talking to students who had been doing team projects on discord so I'm going to start playing video games a lot more so I get better at discord and, and then we'll see how to bring it in the classroom awesome I want to be respectful of everyone's time um, thank you to the panelists for being able to join um, really appreciated you know the discussion we had on how adapted learning is happening in the time of covid um, there's a qr code or feel free to head over to our website to see when our next alumni society meeting is it's happening this next 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 th tuesday so it would be great if everyone can tune in but thanks again everyone appreciate it thanks a lot